Well, welcome back. So glad you are able to catch part two of the Naaman story. Uh, again, one of uh, my favorite pictures that Sherry took. I just wanted you to point out in the upper right-hand corner is the corner of a house. You can just see the eave and part of a window. And then if you, those cliffs are about 60, 65 feet high there. If you go out just about 100 feet from that far group of trees, it just drops right off into the Pacific Ocean. And there's big stacks there and the waves are rolling in. Right now, they're rolling in at about five or six feet out there and crashing into the rocks. I'll bring you pictures of that some other time. But uh, again, Sherry, thank you. Uh, we're right out on the Pacific Coast there in Northern California. Just absolutely one of those gorgeous spots on a sunny day. Thanks, Sherry, so much. So we, um, we left off the story of Naaman, and I want to go to the part two. Gehazi's greed. Dangerous theology of wealth. 2 Kings chapter 5. And there is a theology called the gospel of wealth. And I've been in concerts where I've heard musicians say things like, I know that there's someone out there today who's going to write a check for $10,000 for our music ministry, and God is going to bless you 10 times that amount to inspire people to give to get something from God. Now, that is not exactly and precisely how this story ends, but nonetheless, this is a story about greed and coveting a free will offering that Elisha had refused to accept for the healing of Naaman. Now, I'm going to give you another setting for this story is Elisha and the school of the prophets is in the background here. So when we talk about the characters in the story, they are part of the school of the prophets. In other words, they're teachers, they're assistants, they're helpers, they're students, a number of things. So you just kind of need that little portion in the background for this story. It's a very important thing to understand that the people involved here are people of knowledge of Scripture and of God. But as we all know, people are just themselves. So I hope you just take a moment and hear the story and that it has a lesson for us to not repeat, to be free from, if you would. So, let's continue. So we're in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 20. General Naaman was healed by God. He acted under Elisha's instructions. Now Gehazi was a servant and a member of the school of the prophets. He was also an opportunist. In the previous story, General Naaman had brought over 750 pounds of gold and silver, 10 changes of clothes as a gift to be healed. This is normal pagan thinking. As a gift to be healed, there needed to be a specific offering. Did you catch that? Sometimes that emerges in Christianity more than we want to admit. This is normal pagan thinking. It has almost become at times normal Christian thinking that a large and generous gift would inspire the gods to action. Today we call this the gospel of wealth. When an evangelist or pastor tells you to bring a big offering and God will give you big things, this story is a rebuke to this kind of thinking. So just tuck that away. Okay, let's continue. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, Behold, my master has spared this Naaman, the Armean, by not receiving from his hands what he brought. As the Lord lives, now notice this, he's going to do this in the name of the Lord. I will run after him to take something from him. In other words, this was an offering for the Lord. We shouldn't let it go. Verse 21. So Gehazi pursues Naaman. Naaman sees one running after him. He came down from the chariot to meet him and he said, Is everything okay? Is all well? Listen to Gehazi's word. Words, plural. He said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, 
Behold, just now, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. Now, in the New Testament, one talent would be about 10 months' wages. And two sets of clothes, wow, that's just like unbelievable. Now, let's back up in the story for just a moment. I'm going to assume that Gehazi is kind of considered part of the administration here. And he manufactures a story from the head of the school of prophets, Elisha. My master sent me, begins the lie. I, I just want you to take a deep breath here because church administrators are just people. Gehazi is just one of those people but he sees an opportunity here that he just can't let go of. And it compels him to step off into, <clears throat> may I say, a giant cliff. <clears throat> Naaman is oblivious to this. He says in verse 23, Be pleased to take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags and two changes of clothes and gave them to two of his servants and they carried them before him. Now, there's an ego at play here. This man now has elevated himself, but what you are about to learn is that there is something far bigger behind his request to Naaman. Something far bigger. And I hope you're ready for it. Because God has been at work through this whole story so far. And pay careful attention to what Elisha has to say. So when he came to the hill, he took from them their hand and deposited them in the house and sent them in a way. Kind of sounds like he's keeping all the silver and all the clothes put him in his house, and he sends the servants away. They departed, verse 25. But he went in and stood before his master. The loaded question. And Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. Did you notice how one lie stacks upon top of another, on top of another? What is behind the lie is the spirit of covetousness. He coveted all of that wealth for other reasons than just a moment of satisfaction. Let's continue the story. Then he said to him, this is Elisha speaking still, did not my heart go with you? When the man turned from his chariot to meet you, and I want you to take a deep breath, because Elisha just said, don't you know that what you do represents me, represents the school of the prophets, represents God? Did you catch that? Elisha continues, is it a time to receive money and to receive clothes and Look at the list carefully. Olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants. You see, God had revealed to Elisha the deeper desires of Gehazi. He wanted possessions. He wanted land. He wanted wealth. He wanted servants. Gehazi presented the entire represented the entire school of the prophets and Elisha as well in his action of distortion and lies. Is this true for you? Is it true for me? Do we own our behavior and realize, as Jesus said, if you've done it unto the least of them, you've done it unto me? Do we embrace this concept that God sees you as a shining light on a hill, as representing all that God is in all of your behavior and your actions and what you do and what you say. 
Elisha painted a picture of the materialism of Gehazi's heart. He lusted after wealth. He coveted. Here's the list. Money, clothes, orchards, vineyards, sheep, goats, servants. He wanted the life. Over the past 25 or 30 years, we have seen where, you know, the cameras have crashed in and spied on televangelists, and they have like 17 houses and, and 27 cars and one or two jets. And you can see that even within Christianity today, the spirit of Gehazi is alive and well with material possessions to say, look at God blessed us, how great we are because of all the materialism. That is exactly the opposite of who God is. Now the last words. Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So Gehazi went out from Elisha's presence as a leper as white as snow. Wow. Last slide. A short story with a profound lesson. His lust was no different than the disease of leprosy because the leprosy and his lust for those possessions both would lead to his demise. So how is it with us? To covet bears consequences. Can we learn what we need from this story? It's a million dollar question. Can we take just a moment and say, Lord, I've given you and surrendered everything that I am. Here it is. It is yours. And let the Lord bless it and return it back to be a blessing for all the goodness of who God is and what he desires to do. Our last slide. One of Sherry's beautiful pictures again of uh, up by Salmon, Idaho. Looking across... By the way, this beautiful pasture that off to the right, you can't see it, but there's a herd of cows out there. You can see the remnants of snow after the summer as we're moving down towards the end of the season there. Just beautiful sky. And then that cloud that looks like a seashell. Isn't that just grand and spectacular? I just, Sherry just loves sky pictures and she catches these moments and you go, wow, that is so beautiful, Sherry. Thank you. But let's come back to the story for a minute. What drives you? What is the thing that compels you to do what you do and why you do it? Second of all, how are things with you and God and your community and the general namens of the world? How are things going there? Tuck that away and give it some serious thought. Once again, I want to thank you for taking a few minutes to listen to these incredibly beautiful but very short stories. And may this story be a blessing to all of us. In Jesus' name we would ask. Blessings. Take care. Bye-bye.